basketball know-it-alls are hilarious. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore Beeble. Today's show also brought to you by Hotels.com, by Untuck It and by Grip6 Belt. So check out those guys, fantastic sponsors for this show. We're going to be looking at the Orlando Magic, their season in review today, their upcoming off season, a little bit of previews to coming seasons as well. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. The Orlando Magic, the holders of a 42-40 and 40 record, uh, got into the playoffs for the first time in a long time. Seventh seed, took on the Raptors and lost in the first round, of course. I think you'd have to say it was a relatively successful season. What that means for the future, though, doesn't really change much there. You don't have really huge upside for you know pushing into a top four seed or a conference finals type of team, but getting to the playoffs was important. Taking a game off the Raptors, winning that first game was great as well. They had the eighth best defense with Steve Clifford in his first season. Season as a, as a coach of the Orlando Magic, really, really impressive stuff from Clifford. I was a little bit off on him at the end of his Charlotte tenure, but massive improvement here, Orlando. Eighth in defense, 22nd in offense. Makes sense given some of the uh, the lack of offensive talent they have, but they don't have massively great defensive talent as well, and Clifford was really able to upscale the way that those guys performed. So big kudos to him. They were third in the NBA in defensive rebound percentage. They took care of the ball, seventh in turnover percentage as well. They don't get to the line at all. Absolutely last in the NBA in free throw rate while giving away a lot of free throws on the other end. Sixth in terms of... Uh, sorry. Yeah, limiting opposition free throw as well. Sixth in free throw attempt rate over there as well. Shooting is a concern for them. Under 52% effective field goal percentage, so it needs to be better there. But their defensive stuff was really the most impressive part of what Orlando was able to do for this season. So let's have a look at how things look for their upcoming offseason. They have the 16th pick in the draft and the 46th pick as well. So a couple of options, uh, a couple of picks for them there. You know, that 16th pick, not going to be a huge amount available at that spot, but they've got some really big decisions to make in terms of free agency with Nikola Vucevic and Terrence Ross, both unrestricted free agents. Now they can get, and not including those two guys, if those guys sign elsewhere, they can get more cap space, but they can get almost $20 million in cap space. Um, Sorry, that's not true. They can get they've got eighty five million dollar guaranteed salary at the moment. That's that's if Vucevic and Ross go and their uh, and their restricted guys that they get rid of and their um, uh, team option guys they get rid of. So they can get to nineteen million dollars in cap space, which isn't a huge amount. Orlando not a big free agent destination, obviously, but trying to fill in some gaps around that. The big question is going to be what they do for Vuce. He was paid twelve point seven five million dollars for this season. He's going to be looking for a twenty five plus contract. You'd think. 80, 85 million dollars over four seasons, maybe 100 million dollars over four seasons. What we're looking at for Vooch. The Magic, he's been awesome for them, but how far do they go with him? He really struggled in the playoffs against Marcus Sol and the Raptors, and that's an indication that maybe he can be a strong regular season player, but not that guy who leads them all that far in the playoffs. I do think they'll look to bring him back. Terry Ross is the other one who I think that they might find some other offers come in for Ross that are a little bit uh, too steep, that they won't be as committed to him as what they are to Vucevic as well. So I reckon there's a chance that he goes. The other guy who is a, an unrestricted free agent is Michael Carter-Williams, who actually came in and played pretty good basketball down the stretch, much better than their Isaiah Briscoe, Jaron Grant backup point guard situation. Really was solid. And while it didn't resurrect his career, at least got it back on the track where if a team signs Carter-Williams next season, it won't be like, what is this team doing? Because he showed solid enough play to get out there and be an impactful guy at times. They've got three restricted guys. Jaron Grant, I don't think they're going to be bothered with him. Jarrell Martin. I think he's pretty much cooked in the NBA. But the other guy they will want to bring back, in my opinion, is Ken Birch, who really stepped up, was much better than Muhammad Bamba during the season. One, two, three, four, five. As that backup center. And again, if Vooch leaves, will, is Birch a starting caliber player? No. But the way that he played, I think they will look to bring him back. They've also got a team option on Weza Wundu, who was a, a key part of the rotation for big chunks of this season. I worry where his overall upside goes. But um, I think they'll pick up that team option and bring him back. So that's their free agent decision-making process for this upcoming season, all the decisions they have to make. They've got Gordon and Fournier and Mozgov all under con- and Mozgov all under contract. Sorry, Fournier and Mozgov for one more year. Of course, Mozgov just didn't play at all this season and still has um, 
$16.7 million, maybe stretching him's an option. It's only one year left on that horrible contract. Uh, they're the only guys that they have that, that are paying over $10 million. Uh, Gordon at almost 20, Fournier at 17, and Mozgov at $16.7 million, but he won't be any sort of part of the rotation. Then other guys like Bumba and Isaac under $6 million. DJ Augustin's got one more year left at $7 million. And then the big question mark is going to be Markel Fultz, who has $9.8 million uh, on his contract. For this coming season, they have to make a decision on his fourth-year rookie option, which will pay him $12.3 million as well. That's got to be done at the beginning of the season. So some definite question marks with this team and some big off-season decisions that they do have to make um, to see exactly what this squad's going to look like after an impressive but overall ultimately disappointing in terms of the end, although most Magic fans will be like, hey, we got there, we took a game off the Raptors, that's great to see us in the playoffs, and, and that is true. So yeah, good on them for pushing into that playoff and, and really strong season from... Uh, a really strong season from um, uh, Nikola Nikola Vucevic to get them in, into that uh, into that spot. Just a, a reminder, guys. Today's show is brought to you by Grip Six Belts. So go to grip 6com slash lock l o c k e. They've got a special offer for you over there. It's the only belt with no holes, no flap, no bulk. Great belts for men, for women, for children. Go check out Grip Six Belts. Grip Six.com slash locked. Not locked. Sorry, lock. No D. All right, let's look at this Orlando Magic team. Nikola Vucevic, 31 minutes a game, 80 games, almost, oh no, almost, he's 28 and a half at the moment. He was the 14th ranked player this season. An absolutely huge step forward for Vuce this year. 21 points, 12 boards, over a three, a steal, and over a block per game. A triple one player, really good efficiency, 52 and 79, including 36% from three. 28% usage. How did we get this Vucevic player? Where, where did he improve from? Well, first of all, he played two extra minutes per game. Under Frank Vogel, I thought they ridiculously limited his minutes at times, getting Bismarck Biombo minutes when he shouldn't have been. But we saw the better player get the more minutes here. And of course, he stepped it up. We saw his usage go up. We saw his efficiency go up as well. He's been about this level in terms of steals and blocks each of the last three seasons. Actually, identical. One steal per game each of the last three seasons. 1.1, 1.1, 1.0 blocks each of the last three seasons. And he's had a triple one each of the last two years as well. But what he did this year was take that efficiency up. His uh, three-point shooting went from 31 up to 36%. His two-pointers from 53 to 54 he did drop his free throws from 82 down to 79, but that's still not a, a terrible uh, number, but up, upped his free throw rate as well. And that true shooting up to 57 on a usage of 27 was really where we got there. More minutes, more rebounding, and more efficiency pushed Vooch from being the 34th ranked player up to the 16th uh, ranked player. We also got him playing 80 games. Last season, he played 57, 75 the year before that, 65 the year before that. So a really strong investment that you were able to take in those... Um, in those uh, middle to late rounds, he was going pretty late in some drafts, like 60s in the 60s, and obviously returned that value significantly. Can he do it again next season? Um, there's no real reason if he's back in Orlando to think that he won't. Bumba's not ready to take these minutes off him. He's not good enough to take these minutes off him. Will Vooch be able to maintain that efficiency? I guess that's somewhat of the concern is can he continue to shoot as well as he did because that was the big reason he stepped up. And a lot of it was because he shot 46% on his mid-range twos and it wasn't on a low amount of attempts, 692%. Sorry. Try again, 692 attempts as a mid-range two and hitting him at 46%. That's worrisome because if that drops off, then his value does fall quite a bit. Wasn't, you know, he was okay at the rim, 69%. Giggity. But that's not elite as a big man. But it's the fact that he hit those twos at such a high rate. And that's good. Maybe he is just this excellent of a, of a mid-range shooter that... Yeah, that drops off because each of the last couple of seasons, he wasn't at this level of efficiency. So I have a level of concern there with Vooch that maybe, maybe if that two point and long two shooting does fall off a bit, then he goes from the 14th best player to the 30th or 25th best player. And I think that's a legitimate concern to be having about what he was able to do. But of course, he led this team pretty clearly. Plus 4.73 PIPM, 11.5 wins added. Massive, plus 9.9 .9 on off. Clearly led the team. Clearly their best player. Clearly their best fantasy guy. Aaron Gordon, the 82nd ranked player uh, over the course of the season. Probably be a bit disappointed for Gordon. 34 minutes a game, 16, 7, and 3.7, 1.6 triples. And of course, as usual with Gordon, lack of defensive numbers. 0.7 steals and 0.7 blocks, poor efficiency, under 54% true shooting, field goal percentage is low, free throw percentage is low, three point percentage is low. 
It was a step down from Gordo, who was the 66th best player the year before. We saw his usage drop off by almost three percentage points. We saw his efficiency rise marginally, but it wasn't a, a huge deal. We saw his three-pointers made drop off. We saw his rebound numbers drop off, and we saw his defensive numbers drop off as well. The one thing that did improve were his assist numbers, really started to get the ball in his hands more, and that's that's important. So can he get that usage back, get to 25% usage, get some uh, any, a further improvement in efficiency? Although I, at this point, we have to consider him a 69 to 72% free throw guy. His first five seasons, 72, 67, 72, 70, 72. That's his free throw shooting. That just is who he is, really. He needs to get to the line more. He needs to be more aggressive. And he's got to hit his shots at a higher rate. He needs to be a 55% two-point shooter. He was under 50 this season. But if you pair that with, and that'll come. It, or if that comes with an improvement in efficiency, he can get back to an 18 point per game guy. And then if he's getting almost four assists with seven to eight rebounds a game, then he can be significantly better than this. Will he ever be a top 30 guy? I have significantly significant doubts that he can ever get to that level just because of some of these deficiencies in his game, especially with the defensive stuff. But there is still, when you look at it, room for improvement on a guy who is, of course, still really young, hasn't turned 24 yet, and now has five NBA seasons under his belt. Defensively, I thought he was better this season, plus 0.92 overall PIPM, second on the team in wins added as well. A plus four on off, you know, obviously a key part. His role's not going anywhere. I don't think he's lying to be traded. I think the minutes will be there. It's just getting that efficiency back, a little bit more usage as well, uh, and, and that should be able to uh, to improve his overall status as a fantasy guy. Terry Ross, the next highest ranked player, 110th overall for this season. Only 27 minutes a game, but 15 points, really getting it going off the bench. 24% usage, 2.7 triples, almost a steal, three and a half boards, 43, 88, and 38% from three. So the free throw percentage is nice from Ross, but his ability to score and to hit threes is really what brings that value for him. And over the last uh, couple of months of the season, he did crack himself inside the top 100 as his minutes rose. He started hitting three threes per game, but you do have to really be careful with his field goal percentage. It is, ba it is bad, and it is sort of in that punt territory with how many shots he does take coming off the bench. Still a positive... Um, Contributor in terms of actually, that's, scrap that. Not a positive. He was a negative 2.6 in on-off for this team, and that's that's not encouraging. He was a negative 1.3 PIPM, and you might think it all comes defensively. It actually came offensively. The majority contribution there for the PIPM, and as an unrestricted free agent, I, I think that there is a, a chance that this is the best season that Terry Ross has from a fantasy perspective. Finding another 24 usage role in 27 minutes a game on another team, and I'm not sure the Magic will look to bring him back. It might be a little bit tough. I would be okay with selling my Terrence Ross stock if I could got top 100 ish, top 120 value back. So I'm just not sure he can stick at this this sort of level. And it was a really good season from Ross but he's never really been this level of performer before. His best season in terms of three-pointers made before this year was the 13-14 season where he hit two threes a game in Toronto, and he went all the way up to 2.7 per game this season. Took a, a shit ton more attempts and still hit them at a solid rate. But he is he more Wayne Ellington? Like that's You can get those threes from other areas. Ross is a bit better player than that, but not, not the greatest, not the highest upside sort of a guy. Don't forget to check out our sponsors, Hotels.com. Don't hate like your friend's trip. Book your own with Hotels.com and get rewarded basically everywhere. Hotels.com, be there, do that, and get rewarded. And also, Untuck It. Dads come in all shapes and sizes. So should their shirts. Tall, slim, relaxed, short, whatever it was. Untuck It is the best way to get a shirt that is designed to be worn untucked. No tucking or tailoring required. Go to Untuckit.com and use the promo code NBA to get 20% off. All right. The next guy we look at is my man, Johnny Isaac. Um, I thought a big season was coming from Isaac. It disappointed in the end. 27 minutes a night. I thought he'd be a 30-minute-a-night guy. He did have some injuries during the season, but it wasn't... Um it wasn't the entire reason, but it was a big step up from last year. 27 minutes a night, as I said, for Isaac. 9.6 points. He had 1.1 threes, 5.5 boards, 0.8 steals, and 1.3 blocks with 43, 82, and 32% from three. That shooting needs to get better, and he's a really low usage player. So if we can get that shooting up to 36, 37% from three, we're not crazy. He hit 35% as a rookie. Get that number up, become a 14-point per game guy with 1.5 uh, blocks, 1.1 steals, you know, 1.8 triples. I think that's realistic. 
eight rebounds a game, maybe he can top out it. I think we can get to that level with Isaac. I just love what he does defensively. The team was two points better off with him on the court. Massive defensive PIPM of 1.25, second best on the team behind Vucevic. Uh, overall PIPM was a positive, contributed a lot of wins to this team, and I think that we see him locked in as a starter, even though I believe his best position is at the four or even the five, and maybe things change. If Vuce decides to leave, do they just roll the dice and go with Gordon and Isaac as the four or five and get another guy to come in and play the three? But he can handle it at the three. He can uh, at least handle it defensively. He can guard those wings. Offensively, he's a bit of a problem there at the three and would be much set, better suited to be playing the four or the five. And if that move ever comes for Isaac, then I think his value will really, really skyrocket during um, during his career. But we're not there with him yet. I still think he's going to be worthy as a flyer at the end of drafts with that top 100, top 70 type upside, depending on how things go. A lot of people will be off him. It's a great buy low opportunity in Dynasty Leagues. The bloke's only played 107 NBA games in total, so uh, including playoffs. So it's not like we've got a huge sample size there. That first season almost wrecked by injuries and a few ankle injuries threatened to derail this year as well. He, that efficiency has got to improve. It was a big step up from 47 to 53 true shooting from his rookie year to this year. It can get even better, and I believe that it will, but he's got to be able to do it on a little bit more volume and then get those defensive numbers in. His steal rate actually took a pretty significant step back this season. I think it can uh, it can bounce back. He's still really in the upper echelons of both those categories as a wing player. DJ Augustin. Uh, the 127th ranked player, real surprise season from DJ. I wasn't even sure he'd be the starting point guard. I thought they might give Jaron Grant a chance in a real rebuilding year. It wasn't a rebuilding year. They pushed to the playoffs, and DJ was a huge part of that. And down the stretch, he played more minutes and was significantly better as the season went on. 28 minutes over the course of the year, 12, 2.5, and, and 5 with 0.6 steals. 47 and 87, including a fantastic 42% shooting from three-point range. Great stuff from DJ Augustin this season. As I said, over the last half of the season, played 30 minutes a night or the last you know, couple of months, 30 minutes, 12, uh, 12 and a half and six. Now, he doesn't get steals, has never had a season in the NBA where he's averaged more than 0.8 steals per game. He doesn't block any shots. In fact, he is probably one of the worst shot blockers in the NBA. In fact, this season was his best season in terms of blocking shots, and he blocked five. That's amazing. He blocked zero last year, one the year before, four, three, 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 one, three. Like he just does not block shots. It's almost impressive to be that bad in blocking shots, but a real step up in efficiency for DJ August. And he was one of the key players on this team, plus 1.26 PIPM, second overall on the team, third actually, if you want to include Michael Carter Williams in his 227 minutes, uh, plus 6.1 on off. You think he can probably replicate what he did, but replicating what he did, does that make him maybe a top 110 player? Because he wasn't this year. He wasn't a top 120 guy. And that's going to require some really, really strong shooting. The lack of steals, the low assist numbers, the good three-point shooting on low volume as well. It doesn't really endear him as a must roster or a, a, an upside flyer type of guy at the end of drafts, but really strong again from DJ. And he was a key part to this team being, being as successful as they were. Evan Fournier was trash for a majority of this season, especially from a fantasy point of view. 128th overall. He played 32 minutes, 15 points with two threes, three and a half assists, three rebounds, 0.9 steals on 44 and 81, shooting 34% from three. Some big steps back. He was a 38% three-point shooter last season, so that really impacted him. He didn't get to the line as much. His usage dropped down as well as Vooch took on a larger role, and he was the 70th ranked player last season. So those extra three points per game that he scored were a big, a big reason. The extra seven percentage points on his free throws, a big reason. The extra one attempt per game, a big reason there as well. Uh, the, the field goals went from 46 down to 43. So really just drop-offs all across the board from Fournier, except for assists, which did rise a little bit up to 3.5 as he handled the ball a little bit more in a point guard role under Steve Clifford. Now, will he ever be a top 100 guy again? I think there's a possibility for that. I wouldn't be banking on it. He's not that old. But he's really, how old is he? He's actually, he's 26 and a half, 27 uh, at the start of next season. He's a guy where you go, like, what is the actual upside? He's so uninspiring as a fantasy option. Yeah, neutral PIPM, 0.04. The team was better with him on the court, obviously, 0.4, 0.9. There's yeah, some really strong stuff there, but just overall, probably a better rotisserie than head-to-head -head player. 
And there's just very little excitement in that game. And looking at it, like, where does it get better? Now, if Vooch leaves and no one comes in to replace him, then Fournier's usage is going to have to spike. Terrence Ross's, Aaron Gordon's, John Isaac, they're all going to have to take more shots. And maybe that pushes him to be back to a 19-point-per-game guy, which becomes really valuable and probably a top 100 guy in that sort of a situation. But if that doesn't take place, if that doesn't happen, then you're left sort of with Fournier being who he is at this stage. Mo Bumba, a, a quite a disappointing rookie season. 47 games. It ended with a, a broken leg injury. 16 minutes, 6 points, 5 boards, 1.4 blocks, 48 and 59 for a true shooting of under 54%. He just didn't get he didn't get done what he needed to get done. Never outplayed Vooch. Didn't take over from it at the end of the season. I think if they signed Vooch back to a big contract, he's going to be stuck in this uh, in this back end area. Now, the block numbers are impressive, no doubt about that. 1.4 blocks in 16 minutes. Give him 30 minutes. You're talking about a two block blocks per game guy, but with how poor he was on court, he's a long way from getting enough minutes to be impactful. Offensively, just a disaster. Can't pass. The shooting was a problem. Negative 3.39 PIPM was a, a negative 16.2 on off, which some of that's due to how well Birch and, and Vucevic play, but that's also a really, really hard number to get to. A negative wins added player overall. I still have some hope for Bummer, but I'm not convinced that he ever becomes a full-time 30-minute per game starting center. Centers, they can struggle a lot in their first season, so there could be a really big step forward for Mo coming in this coming season. I'm not massively high on it. I dropped him down in my dynasty ranks. It just He wasn't good on the court. He struggled quite a bit. If Vooch is back, then he's in trouble. If Vooch is gone, I, I don't trust him to be a big minute starting center, and I just don't think we're ever going to get any sort of semblance of offensive game. He will never pass. He won't generate steals, and the efficiency and free throw percentage is going to be an overall problem, I believe guy we need to talk about, we just don't know what the hell to get out of this guy, is Markel Fultz. 21 years of age, only played 19 games, 23 minutes a game, all of those for the Sixers, 8 and 3.5 with 3 assists and 0.9 steals. The shooting is the problem, 42% from the field, 57 from the line, and 20, 29% from 3. Everything else there is pretty bloody interesting. The high steal rate, the high rebounds, the high assists, the solid enough blocks, scoring was okay, 20% usage, there's value there, and he hopefully... He's going to come into the season healthy and have a chance to take that backup point guard spot, at least the backup point guard spot. But maybe we get him starting alongside DJ Augustin and playing 30 minutes a night with DJ, limiting some of Fournier's playing time as well, especially if Terrence Ross goes. You've got Jaron Grant and Michael Carter-Williams. Fultz is a guy that I'm going to at least look at it as a real buy-low dynasty guy and he's going to have that opportunity. They want him to be their point guard of the future. Probably won't be this season, but maybe the season after. This will be a really telling year to see where Fultz goes. But I think there's a chance that he could at least push into the top 200, maybe top 170 for this season. And not you know in a 14-team league as a last-round flyer, I think there is value in Fultz. But so much more of that's going to be determined when we see what happens over the off-season and the pre-season in, in particular to see if he's actually going to play. Uh, I am really interested to see what Fultz is going to be able to do because there is a good fantasy player lurking under that. The, the shooting is a real worry, but his ability to fill multiple stat categories, we've seen it during his time. He just needs to be able to hit his shots, and I have not given up hope on Markel Fultz. Ken Birch, I thought, was pretty impressive. 13 minutes a game, 5-4, and 4, 0 0.4 steals, 0 0.6 blocks, 60 and 70 as his percentages. True shooting of 64%. That's really, really strong from Birch. Defensively solid, a positive PIPM, a positive 0.9 on off. Some really strong numbers from Birch. A restricted guy, as I said, I think they should be looking to bring him back, if not to be the third string guy, to maybe challenge Bumba to be the second string guy. He does have marginal fantasy value, but you know, 27 when next season starts, is he just ever going to turn into a guy like, say, Kylo Quinn or Dwayne Dedman? That's the sort of, I know they're both former Orlando centers, that's the sort of guy that he can become if he gets those minutes. He's not as good as those players, in my opinion, so it's going to be harder for him to get significant playing time to get there. But in deeper leagues, I think just a rock-solid guy for the next couple of seasons in that role. Um, it really, I was impressed with what he did. Jaron Grant, it couldn't have been worse for Jaron, a restricted free agent. I'm not sure he even finds himself in the league next season. China is probably beckoning. While Michael Carter-Williams, a solid resurrection, struggled significantly in Houston, traded to Chicago, waived, and then signed 
by the Orlando Magic and at the end of the season was putting up some decent numbers. Of course, he still has no idea how to shoot, but was a massive positive, especially defensively. Um, I think that if he does come back, then a lot of his minutes are going to go towards Fultz, especially at the beginning of the season. But he was a huge, huge factor for this team down the stretch as they pushed into the playoffs. He's always a name to watch because if he finds himself in 30 minutes a night, he will be a top 120 contributor, no doubt, because he fills it up. Points, rebounds, steals, assists, blocks. He can do all of those things. Just can't shoot, but he can fill up those numbers. So he's always a name to watch. I don't think he's ever coming into any scenario and being a, um, a, a starting point guard caliber player in the NBA. A guy who saw a larger role this season was Wezawundu. He's got a team option for this season. 18 minutes a game, 68 games, 5 points, half a 3, 2.7 rebounds, 0.4 steals, 0.3 blocks on 41 and 82 with 37% shooting. I'm not massively into Wezawundu. I thought, think he struggles quite a bit. Negative 2.35 PIPM is not an ideal number. Uh, the team was 1.4 points better off with him on the court. Just I quickly mentioned uh, Jaron Grant, who was a negative 8 on off. That's how horrible he was. Uh, and Bumber, as I mentioned, negative 16.2 is uh, unbelievably bad. But Awundu, I guess, at least showed that he can step up into that role and played a, a lot more when Isaac was hurt. Um, if Ross goes, there's going to be a larger role there for Wes. But I don't really see it for him. He's not a volume three-point shooter. Shot well, 37%. It's on really low volume. Doesn't get to the line that much. He's a low usage guy who doesn't contribute assists, rebounds, steals, or blocks. And that makes it hard for those sort of guys to have consistent fantasy presence. So while he is heading into his third season and guys can take the steps up, I don't really see much there from a Wundu. And then you've got their other guys uh, on the periphery. Jarrell Martin, I already mentioned, not much there. Melvin Frazier was uh, pretty disappointing, who came in with a lot of hype, and I was pretty interested in him. He just did not look uh, all that comfortable out in the court. But again, with Ross gone, there could be an opportunity. And then they're two two-way guys, Emilio Jefferson and Troy Copain, guys who put up some really strong uh, G League numbers. Jefferson had a 2.98 PIPM and Copain had a 2.83. They didn't wow us when they had the opportunity in the NBA games. So I thought I thought Jefferson did all right in only six minutes a game, two and two at 63% and 88 from the line. That's strong enough. It's really limited, of course, in terms of uh, playing time. But I thought he showed enough. He's a guy that I'd pay some attention to, but he is 26. And Copain at 23, he didn't do enough. I thought we'd see something out of him this season, but they went with guys like Briscoe and Carter Williams over Copain. And yeah, maybe he's just a really good G League player, and that's about it. And I think that's probably where we sit with Copain and Jefferson. But they are two of the more productive G League guys that if opportunity did get come their way, they would be interesting enough fantasy guys. Not to the level of, say, someone like Christian Wood, who came in and blew up out of the G League, um, but more someone along the lines of, say, an Alex Caruso type of player, where when the minutes come... Uh, they can be productive. Even like a Tom Bryant guy, in uh, he had that big G League season for the Lakers and then was starting for the Wizards. Now, maybe that's a little bit of a step forward for these guys, but they are at least names to keep in your head where you hear, hey, why is Troy Copain the backup point guard on a team? And you go, shit, uh, there is something there. Why is Emile Jefferson playing uh, minutes and looks to be second on the depth chart? Just just names to watch. You know, whereas guys like Jarrell Martin and Melvin Frazier, I'm not as interested in those sort of guys. That'll wrap it up for the Orlando Magic season in review show. Make sure you are subscribing to this podcast on the Himalaya podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and on Spotify. Make sure you check out our sponsors, Grip6, Belts, Untuck It, and Hotels.com. And follow me on Twitter at RedRock underscore Beeble and the network at Locked On NBA Net on Twitter and on Instagram. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Wes Ubuntu.